Morning everyone and welcome to our service of worship this morning here in Vandenberg Uniting Church. It's fantastic to be with you, lovely to be part of celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion together. And a special word of welcome if you are tuning in from outside of Vandenberg, it's fantastic to have you with us and we pray that you'll be blessed as we continue in this phase of our, of our journey as a church through the lockdown period and through uh, navigating the twists and turns of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. Please drop us a, a comment if, um, if uh, telling us where you're from, saying hello, good day, and uh, we'd love to respond to you. We'll try and get to all of those comments, but engage with us. The whole idea of a Facebook Live feed is that engagement is possible. And so we'd love to hear a comment. We'd love to see the little uh, reaction buttons as we go along in the sermon. And uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, last week, I know that some folks had some trouble with subtitles. And uh, the best solution that I could find was on your Facebook feed, on the bottom right-hand corner is a little gear for settings, if you click on that gear, it'll take you to something called captions. And if you turn off those captions, uh, I think that should solve the problem. If it doesn't, let me know about it and I'll try and see what else I can work out for next week. But friends, as I say, it's lovely to have you with us. We are sharing the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning. So I hope you've had a chance to get some bread or some gluten-free crackers or wafers and some juice, some water, whatever's handy. And we'll share together a little later in the service in the sacrament. If you haven't had that, then uh, at the first ad break, please uh, make sure you go and, uh, and grab yourself uh, some elements for communion. As we begin our worship, shall we bow our heads in prayer? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we give you thanks for your hand upon our lives. We give you thanks for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we continue to enjoy, to celebrate, and to live in. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who's not locked away behind a stone inside a cold tomb, but you are living, you are alive, and, and we enjoy a personal relationship with you. You interact with us. You are part of our journeys from day to day. You are faithful to us even when we are unfaithful to you. You remain true to your promise of never leaving nor forsaking us. And for all of these things, Lord, we love you and we worship you. We rejoice, Lord God, in the Spirit, uh, in the Holy Spirit, who strengthens and empowers us to live out the resurrected life, to live out the, the victory of the cross, not being bound in sin and shame, but living in the freedom, knowing that forgiveness has been, has been bought and paid for a done deal 2,000 years ago. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the empowerment you give us to live faithfully for Jesus Christ. Where we have not listened to you, where we have not submitted to your power, forgive us, we pray. Allow us to sense the redemption that comes from the resurrected Christ. Allow us to enjoy the freedom that comes from, from a God who remembers our sins no more. We thank you that as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, that forgiveness is something which speaks deep into our hearts and souls as we take the elements, the body and the blood of Jesus, and, and make them part of who we are. May it be a special moment for us today, we pray. May you be glorified in the service. May your name be praised. May you hear our heart's desire to honor you. We ask these things in and through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, our reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John. And I read from chapters, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. This is one of the resurrection appearances. It it's, uh, happens right at the very end of John. And um, it's, a, it's a passage in which uh, precedes the reinstatement of Peter. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 90 meters. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there were fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, part of our worship each and every Sunday is to express our love for God and the gifts that we bring to him. I thank you for your faithfulness during this time, for the many who have switched over to online giving and the many who have made their way to the church office to uh, drop their envelopes in and, uh, and thank you for your faithfulness. We worship God with our gifts. It's not simply giving money, but it is an opportunity for us to say, God, we love you, not just with our voices, but with our whole lives. Everything reflects your glory and this offering is part of my worship to you, part of my expression of love, the gift that I give. And so we're going to pray and give thanks to God for those offerings. If you would like to be part of our giving, the details are on the website and uh, easy to find, or you can drop them in at the office or, or contact uh, Vanessa at the office and she can give you those details as well. We're going to combine our offering prayer together with our intercessory prayer which is our prayer for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we give to you these gifts of money through online giving and through those that have been brought into the church office, we thank you that you are using these gifts to continue your work of ministry in this church. We pray and ask that you would bless those gifts that are given, give wisdom to those that distribute, Use them, Lord, to further your work and to bring others into a knowledge of your love for them. We pray for those who do not know you, for those who do not know the power of the resurrection, for those in this difficult time who have no anchor that holds them, nothing to, to fall back onto. 
no sense of a spiritual connection with you in which they can rest and find peace. We lift them before you. We pray for those, Lord, who are struggling through this pandemic. And while we thank you, Lord, for the, the very low infection rates in our country, we are mindful of the high death rates in some of the other countries and bring those people before you. We pray for the medical staff and for the scientists and pray your blessing upon them and your protection over them. We pray, Lord, for those who at this time are feeling the loneliness of isolation far more than normal. Be present to them in a very real way. We pray for those, Lord, who, for whom home is not a safe place. For those who suffer from uh, the fear of and threat of domestic violence. Protect them, we pray. We pray for all of our first responders. We pray for our government. We pray for our own needs, those things that are known just to ourselves and to you. All these prayers, together with the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we bring to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you do online giving, please just mark it in the reference column, uh, City Offering, and um, you can leave your name out. That's absolutely fine. It just helps us. Uh, to direct those funds. As we uh, move into the sermon, we're going to be speaking about uh, living out the resurrection message. So we pray and ask God to open our hearts to hear his word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God our Redeemer, Saviour and Friend. May your spirit speak to us in words we understand. May the message be relevant in each of our lives that we would know, having, having listened, that we have heard from you, for you have challenged and spoken to us. In your precious name, amen. And just before I start, a quick uh, little reminder of uh, the new segment we've started during the week called Connecting Conversations. And uh, each week we're going to be interviewing a special guest to have a chat about the sermon and, and about things in general, life in general, and uh, just connect with one another. It's again an interactive format where you are able to put comments in and be part of the discussion. So 7 o'clock um, Bundaberg time and, uh, on, our face, on our Facebook page and then a couple of hours later it will be up on, on YouTube and Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts and all of those uh, different formats as well. So, as I read this passage, it has a special place in my heart because when I think of a miraculous catch of fish, I think about my own miraculous catch of fish. This week I shared a memory, uh, a Facebook memory of the fish that my brother Alan and I caught. I'll show you a picture of it, the one that I shared on Facebook. Hopefully it's up there for you to see. And I share it with you for no particular reason other than to say, that's a really big fish. Isn't it amazing? But in fact, it's so amazing. I'll share a second photo of the fish with you as well. This one, you can see uh, the true size of it as, um, as I hold it out in my arms. And uh, this was the best catch of our lives. We caught it in a, in a competition. It was South Africa's biggest deep sea fishing competition. The entry was capped at 4,000, uh, 4, 400 boats. And we came in third. We came third. And for a while, we were actually winning. But the final boat beat us by just 700 grams. That was it. In the context of that fish, 700 grams is nothing. I won't bother you with all of the details now, but if you would like to hear the story, please just ask me and I'll happily tell you the whole thing. And if I've already told you, I'll tell you again. There's no problem at all. In fact, I've been telling this story for six years now and it never gets old. Well, never gets old for me and for Alan. It may 
get old for other people, I'm not sure. The long and the short of it, though, is this. That although it was this fantastic catch, there's a part of the story that we often don't tell. I can take the picture off. We, um, thanks, Lise. We, and it's a part of the story that I don't think any fisherman ever really tell. Um, I mean, we get told about the size of the catch, but nobody ever tells you about the hours of preparation, about the work that went into maintaining the boat, about the frustration of the day, about the, the patience that you needed. Nobody tells you about the not catching and the waiting, the waiting, the waiting that went before you finally land the big one. You don't see any of that in the photo. But the disciples' story is a little different. We are told of their frustration. We're told of their difficulty. For the disciples, it was a long, dark, lonely, tiresome night, backbreaking work, and the frustration of not catching anything. Any fisher person, any fisherman will tell you uh, how frustrating it is not to catch. But imagine if it was your actual profession. If this was your whole life's work, you'd been doing this since you were, were able to walk. And yet they had nothing to show for it. That must have been tough. And here's the first clue as to the fact that the story actually has nothing to do with the catch of fish. If it was about the catch, they would have left out all of that part about what went on through the night. They might have even left out the part of the fact Jesus told them where to throw their nets. This isn't about the fish. And that's the big difference. For Alan and I, the story is about the catch. It'll always be about the catch. But for the disciples, the story is about what happened after the catch. Because just like the road to Emmaus, the story of Easter and the story of the resurrection is all about what comes after the event. What happens after the big moment? What, what was the effect that that moment has on the way that we live our lives? We're a few weeks out from the resurrection now. We celebrated Easter and we started to move on. And the timing of us reading this passage now is almost exactly the same timing that it was for the disciples after Jesus rose from the dead. It had been a couple of weeks for them too. Jesus is alive. That's great. We've seen him. We've celebrated. He's alive. Wonderful. Now what? What happens now? And when you read the story, it's almost as if for the disciples, the resurrection actually at this point has had a net effect of zero on their lives. Yes, Jesus was alive, but they had failed him in his most pressing moment. They're probably in their mind guilty of something pretty unforgivable uh, at this stage. And therefore, again in their minds, think that they're of no further use to God at all. So at the end of all of this time, they simply return to doing what they were doing before. It's almost as if Jesus and the resurrection was a lovely thing. It's great that he's alive. But I guess now things have to go back to normal. I mean, you'd have to ask, why else would they be doing what they were, said they were, what they were doing in the first place before they met Jesus? They knew he was alive, so why would they be going back to something they lasted three and a half years ago, if not for things just returning to normal? The answer probably lies somewhere in the fact that till this moment, the resurrection for them was something to be celebrated. But Jesus wanted it not just to be an event that is celebrated or that we feel happy about, but Jesus wants it to be a moment that is lived out in our lives. A moment that actually changes us forever. The resurrection isn't just about a celebration, isn't about a great day and Easter Sunday, but it's a whole new way of living because it's meant to be lived. It's meant to change us. I read a quote that said, the problem with Christianity is that we have taken Easter and made it into airport theology. It's all about the departure and the arrival. Jesus departs and Jesus arrives. 
And that filters through to us. We've made Christianity an airport theology. We depart this life and we arrive at eternal life. Departures and arrivals. Airport theology. But that's not the point at all. The point is living in the life-changing power of the resurrection. And doing that now. Living in that way now. That's part of the reason why we have communion and why we share communion often. It's a reminder for us of the fact that we are living in the resurrection. The body was broken, the blood was shed, so that we might live in the power of a resurrected Jesus. Every time we take communion, we're remembering that. And we're committing to that. It isn't just a coincidence that Jesus keeps breaking bread for his followers in his post-resurrection appearances. On the walk to Emmaus, he breaks the bread. He's standing on the beach. He breaks the bread. Do this, Jesus is saying. Remind yourselves that your lives are now different. That you don't just celebrate the resurrection, but you should be living it. It should be part of you. It's not just something for the next life. It's something for now. As if we needed any evidence of that, we see the story unfolding on the beach and Jesus taking the old lives of the disciples and saying, you've gone back. You've said, we're going back to normal. No, 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 no. Things have changed. Your lives are different now. <clears throat> How's it different? Well, when you live in the power of Jesus, when you live in the power of the resurrection, Jesus is real. He isn't just a figure or a story we celebrate. He's real. For the disciples, yes, they had seen him a couple of times. They had seen the scars. They had seen the nail marks. They had seen where the spear went in. But up until now, Jesus has almost these kind of ghost-like qualities. He appears through locked doors. He disappears as quickly as he appears. Suddenly he's in the garden, then he's on the road to Emmaus, then he's in the upper room. And all the while he's speaking quite intellectually about the fulfillment of prophecies and the foretelling of the, the resurrection, which is now complete. Yes, he's alive. But for the disciples, it wasn't the same as before. It was all weird now. Who was he? Where was he? What was he? Where did he go? Why didn't he say goodbye? Where is he now? But it is this encounter on the beach, it's this moment that the disciples discover that the Jesus they knew so well before is still the same Jesus. He is real. He's completely known to them. He's familiar. He talks to them about fishing. He's there in bodily form. He even makes a fire on the beach and has some fish on it. He eats with them like he's done so many times before. He gave them bread and fish, like he's done exactly before. They must have laughed and celebrated and chatted about the catch of fish, this huge amount that they finally caught after catching nothing all night. This was the Jesus of old. We were even told that none of the disciples dared ask who he was because they knew. They knew it was him. There was no confusion. No mysteriously being kept from being recognized like on the road to Emmaus. This was Jesus, their friend, their leader, their Lord. And he was real. In this moment, Jesus changes from being something out there to a real God right beside them. In the same way, friends, we take this truth with us too. It's always very difficult to grasp the reality of God. Atheists will often mock people of all types of faith and say that they have imaginary friends. But living in the resurrection means that Jesus is real for you and I as well. We may not have seen him or had breakfast with him like the disciples, but he is a real God who, just like with the disciples, knows us, has been with us. All of our lives, he gets us. He understands us. Our reality is not something foreign to him. Jesus is real for you and for me. And he relates to us. 
like he related to the disciples. Like the disciples, we too can get to the end of Easter and find that we really enjoyed the time. It was a great experience. It was a wonderful celebration. Easter Sunday, fantastic. But ultimately, as the weeks draw on, life has to get to some kind of normality again. And God can start to seem pretty far away. A nice story is the resurrection is, but we've got to get back to our normal lives. But friends, Easter isn't just to celebrate. It is to live. And the power of the resurrection is meant to be something that changes us. From deep within, like the disciples, it begins with knowing that Jesus is real, that he understands, that he relates, and that he is here in our lives. Which brings us to the second thing that the disciples learned that day about living the resurrection or living in the power of Easter, which is Jesus is present, even when it doesn't feel like it. Jesus is with us even when it doesn't feel like he's there. Have you ever wondered how Jesus knew where to find the disciples? How did Jesus know that they hadn't caught any fish? How did he know that they were hungry? The answer is simple. He was there all along. He was with them even though it didn't seem like it. When they were feeling so down and despondent, Jesus was there. In the midst of their confusion, Jesus was there. Through the long frustrating night, Jesus is there. And they learned that day on the beach that he knows all things. That their friend didn't have to be physically present to be with them spiritually. As we discussed in Tuesday's Connecting Conversations, this is something we often only see in hindsight. When we look back on the most difficult times of our lives and we, we see that in moments when we might have thought we were alone, or felt that we were alone, Jesus is actually present. The last couple of days actually have, there's been a video circulating on Facebook called uh, The Great Realization. And while acknowledging the awfulness of the virus and the, the death and the economic issues that it has brought, this video looks at what good might be coming of all of this. Let's take a look. <sighs> Tell me the one about the virus again. Yeah, I'll go back. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favourite. I promise, just once more. Okay, snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. Story starts before then, in a world I once thought well. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight 2020. You see, the people, see, the people came, up came up with companies, with companies to trade, trade across, across all lands, lands. but they swelled out much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have anything you dreamed of in a day, and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted, and the work-life balance broke, and the children's lives grew square. And every toddler, every toddler had a phone. phone. They filtered, they filtered out the imperfections, out the imperfections but, amidst but amidst the noise, the noise they felt they alone. alone. And every day the skies grew thicker, till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies. More convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While we all were hidden, amidst the fear, and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you, 
and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe, and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the sea. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new, and every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realisation. And yes, since then, there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's 2020. As I said in the first or second week of the shutdown, not for one minute do I believe that the virus is sent by God, or that some judgment by God is it's some judgment by God or, or something that God is using to teach us all the lesson. But I do believe that in the midst of this confusing, chaotic, terrible time, Jesus is present. Yes, definitely. Even if it doesn't feel like it, Jesus is present because that's what living in the resurrection is all about. It's about knowing that he's there even when we don't see him, even when we don't feel him. Jesus' presence was very different from the disciples, um, very different for the disciples. From now on, they had, to, they had to come to know that he wasn't necessarily with them in the moment. But that didn't mean that he wasn't with them at all. In the beginning of prayer, I, I prayed a prayer where I said, Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful even when we are not. Christ is present. And living in the power of the resurrection is carrying that truth within us. For the disciples, this moment equipped them for what the rest of their lives, the challenges the rest of their lives would be. Spreading the gospel, uh, changing the world, the imprisonment that they would face, the martyrdom that they would go through, whatever. In their good moments of powerful sermons and amazing miracles, Jesus is present. In the difficult moments of pain and even death, he's present there too. They would never again doubt that he is with them. Likewise, we carry the same truth. Jesus is present. He's present with us even when it doesn't feel like it. You and I, we live complicated lives. We have pressures and difficulties and demands upon us. There are problems, there are heartaches, there are fears and hurts, especially now. Things that deeply worry us at this time. But the experience of Easter, to live in the resurrection, means that we know Jesus is with us. He is no longer in that tomb. He is not an out-of-touch God. He is with us now, all of the time. When we are faced with that pain and difficulty, He is there. When we rejoice in wonderful moments, He is there too. And lastly, the disciples learned that day that Jesus resurrects their lives. The disciples didn't feel like they were able to do what Jesus wanted them to do. That's why they went back to fishing in the first place. Things had gone wrong, very, very, very wrong. From denial to desertion to betrayal to falling asleep when the company of soldiers arrived on, uh, on, the, on that fateful night, to running away to embarrassment, to shame and, and to fear. They had not done any of the things that they thought they would do when the trouble started. They would have given anything to have those moments again, I think. But they couldn't. They had all messed up. But they discover in this moment that far from God writing them off, 
Jesus resurrects them. The old mistakes are allowed to die on the cross and the new life they are to lead is resurrected with Christ. Again, that's what we do when we take Holy Communion. We become part of Christ's broken body. We take it within us that we might be also part of his resurrection. In our lives, there are moments that I'm sure we want over. We want to do over a mulligan, another shot. There are things which we wish we had done differently. There are struggles that we face every day that we, we might even think make us unworthy for what God has planned for us. But we don't just celebrate Easter. It isn't just a day. It's a life. We live it. And to live it is to know the power of the resurrected life, the power of a forgiven life, the power of a renewed life. This is not just about when we die. It's about living the life God wants for us now. And that is a resurrected life. Knowing the power of the resurrection. Living the Easter message instead of just celebrating a weekend on the Christian calendar. Jesus is real, Jesus is present, and Jesus resurrects our lives. Let me close with a resurrection story. It's told by a congregational minister called Robin Myers, and he speaks of a moment of resurrection in his own life and ministry. I read it, it's an extract from his book, and uh, I read it as he writes it. <clears throat> a woman in my own congregation spent more than a decade despising me. Or at least I thought she did. I was too liberal, and I had persuaded the deacons to remove the American flag from the sanctuary and place it in our fellowship hall. My explanation about any symbol of a nation state in the house of prayer for all people could not be heard above the fact that she believed that I did not honor veterans, including her husband. Sunday mornings became an elaborate ritual of avoidance including extraordinary measures to avoid passing me in the hallway. If she saw me coming, she turned and went the other way. It was her church, but I was not her pastor. When I greeted her, there was no response. She only communicated with me through surrogates. And near the end of her life, she issued an ultimatum. If I did not insist that the congregation sing Battle Hymn of the Republic, Within six weeks, she would resign from the church. Needless to say, we did not sing the hymn in the required period of time, and she made good on her threat. She disappeared for several years, and I enjoyed her absence. Then word came that she was dying. She was in an intensive care in a hospital near my house, and I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to go and see her. But I didn't want to. I reasoned that she was no longer a member and that I was the last person on earth she would want to see anyway. I joked with my wife, Sean, about the real impact of a visit, what the real impact of a visit might be. Would I make her worse? What if she died when I entered the room? Sean persuaded me that a visit was the right thing to do because about such things she is almost always right. To what oath are you bound, Robin? She asked me, visiting only the people you like? I headed for the hospital, feeling vaguely as though I was about to be the first minister ever to kill someone by making a hospital call. I approached the nurse's station and decided to give advance notice of my approach. That way she could send word that she didn't want to be bothered. After all, I had nothing good to report about the prospects for singing Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I knew that she was going to ask me. The nurse returned from her room and said, go right in. I turned the corner and from the corridor I saw her lying on her deathbed, with tubes running out of her nose and mouth and into numerous ports in her body. This is so often the soundtrack of death, the clicking and wheezing of artificial life support. I hesitated at the door, only to have her raise her arm and motion me to come to her bedside. Before I could say a word, she lifted herself up <clears throat> in defiance of all of those tubes and all that misery. She wrapped her arms around my neck 
and kissed me on the mouth. I'm so glad you came, she said. We talked for two hours, catching up on children, the church she no longer attended, and the sad state of the world. She died the next day. And Robin ends his story with this simple sentence. He says, <clears throat> Some people would argue that this is not a resurrection story and has nothing to do with Easter. That is unfortunate. Indeed, it is a resurrection story. Christ resurrects us. He's real. He is present. He resurrects our lives. Amen. Let us share in that moment of resurrection as we take the Holy Communion together. Once again, it's a privilege to have Reverend uh, Ray Nutley come forward to help me uh, with communion. And I will read parts of the liturgy, which we hope will be on the screen. And you will uh, see those parts. You will respond in the parts of Ray, which Ray will read for us. Ray and I will then take communion from our own Thanks. And I hope that you've had an opportunity to get uh, the communion elements ready for yourself and for your family. It's really simple. It's Christ's table that we are that we are coming to at his invitation. And so we start with the communion message. Friends, look as you gather around these tables. They are decked out with simple things. Bread and wine. Gifts of the earth that remind us that like them, each one of us holds within us the fingerprints of God who made us. At this table, we are invited to draw up a chair and to dine with the saints and to feed our souls. Here we sit with the priests and the prophets, prisoners and poets, whose testaments live on in God's group along with all of the friends and faithful guides who live on within our hearts. So with this in mind, we raise our voices together with countless others, saying, Holy, 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 Holy God, of all creation and life, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God, Hosanna in the heights. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread and wine and recreated them with a new purpose. We take this bread, and friends, if you would take your bread and or the, the wafers that you have. And as we break it, we remember Jesus' words, Take and eat, this is my body broken for you. And then we take this cup, and as we raise it, we remember Jesus' words. Take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sin. We break bread together and, and we become the living body of Christ. We share the cup together and we, we become agents of God's grace. We say together, Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy. And not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy to be gathered the crumbs under your table, but your grace makes us worthy, and on that we leave So feed us with the body and blood of Christ we pray, resurrecting to life, the life you call us. Amen. Friends, take the bread that is broken, pass it to one another. In your family and say the body of Christ broken for you. May the body of Christ broken for you. And take the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for us because of his love for us. Take it. We spend a few moments in here.
We pray the prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly land, prepared for all people. Thank you very much, Ray. Friends, as we have received the sacrament of Holy Communion, participated in the body and blood of Christ, heard his message to us, may you know God's peace upon your life. Take a moment and look at the family that are around you. If you're, if you're by yourself, know that I'm saying it to you at home. May the peace of God be with you. Thank you. And shall we say the benediction together? If you know it at home, say it with me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and with those whom we love this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, a reminder that I would love to catch up with you on Tuesday in our Connecting Conversations. We have a fantastic guest lined up, so log on to see who it is, and uh, you will enjoy this conversation. I, know. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday and uh, catching up with you again in the week. God bless. Have a wonderful day.